another amen. amen i welcome you tonight in jesus name amen. let me hear your amen now amen. the lord will bless you amen. will enrich your life amen. you will never be the same again in jesus name amen. welcome again to a leadership development and today we have the letter what now tell me are you following through say it confidently that the s today success in your life spiritual advancement in your life it will happen father we thank you for tonight we bless your name we well, thank you because we know you've gathered us for something good, something spectacular. And your hand will be upon everyone tonight in Jesus' name. Lord, wake up those who are sleeping. And let the strength of the Almighty come into everyone that this work will prosper in our hand in Jesus' name. We we'll bless your name because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're reading from Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22. And we're reading from verse 30. Ezekiel 22. Verse 30. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the edge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. God can work independent of man, but he does not. God can do all things without a man, a woman getting involved, but he does not. It is not everything God can do that he does without man. Over here in verse 30 it says, I sought for a man among them. The land was under siege. The land was under oppression. And the land was going towards destruction, devastation, total corruption. And God said, you could change man it could change every tribe. It could change a nation without anybody getting involved. But it will not. I sought for a man among them that should make up the edge. <clears throat> not only make up the edge, stand in the gap before me, between me and the people. He said, so that I will not destroy that land. But I found none. Look at verse 31. Therefore, because I found no man, therefore, because I found no woman, therefore, because I found no leader, no helper, nobody to stand between me and the people and intercede for the people, therefore, have I poured out my indignation upon them. If he had found a man he was looking for, or a woman he was looking for, he would not have poured the indignation out upon the people. I have consumed them with fire, the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, says the Lord God. Tonight, we're looking at the message, searching for leaders after God's own heart. Searching for leaders after God's own heart. You can tell here what the Almighty himself said, that he was seeking for a man that will stand between him and the people. Searching for leaders after God's own heart. When God finds such a leader, what are we going to say about them? Number one, they are saved and separated from common use. They are saved. Those are the kind of men or women 
that God is looking for, that God will pick up and it will use for a special assignment. They are saved and separated from common use. Number two, they are sanctified, not only sanctified and selfless. They are saying, I know the weight of the work. I know the difficulty on the job. And I know all that God is calling me for. And I know what he's looking for. He wants me to stand between him and the people. In evangelism, in prayer, in edification, in enlightenment. So that I will give them the knowledge of the word and they will not perish. They must be sanctified and selfless people. Number three, they are sought out and selected. It says, I'm looking for a man. If I can find the man, I will search him out. I will select him. Number four, number three, they are selected for special service. It's a special service. All the services that men or women may do on earth, that one will not remove the judgment of God from Sodom and Gomorrah. That one will not remove the judgment of God from the antediluvian world at the time of Noah. It's a special assignment and selection for a special service. Number four, they are set apart from ordinary good work around them. You see, there are many other things we could do, very good things. But that will not fulfill what God is searching for. There are good people, born again, children of God. They're nice, they're righteous, but they are not caught out for their special assignment. They are, for, they are of the ordinary, and they are of the ordinary. But if somebody makes himself different from the ordinary, the Lord looks at him and he sets him apart from ordinary good people who do the regular things. Number five, they're set apart. In, in number four, they are set apart from ordinary people. Number five, they are set apart for God and by God. God says, I found him. I will choose him. I will send him forth. He is special. It's not like everybody in his family. Like David was not like everybody in his family. All those people that went to the battlefield, they heard when Goliath came out and said, Choose me a man that will fight against me. If he destroys me and defeats me and kills me, then we will be the servants and the slaves of the children of Israel. If I kill him, that man, that you choose, that you select, that you put forth. If I kill him, then you will be our servants and our slaves. And all those uh, members of the family of David could not come out. They were there. They were there. They were like the other people, ordinary. But now David came out and he was different. The Lord set him apart for himself. And the Lord himself set him apart. Apart to do what? Set him apart to do at that time what angels could not do. Think about that. As the children of Israel faced the Philistines, God could have sent an angel, but no, he didn't. They had a king, but the king could not do anything. And they had all those people in the army of Saul. They couldn't do anything. And David came out to do what angels could not do. There are times God might send an angel. Like he sent an angel against the Assyrians. And 185,000 of them were destroyed. But now he has a job to do. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. Get them out of darkness into the light. Angels could do it, but they will not. Because the Father in heaven and the Son, Jesus Christ, has not committed that into their hands. The angel told Philip, go to Giza. 
in the way of the desert, you'll find a man there, speak to him. Angel, you are telling me, Philip, I'm a human being. You know he is there. Why don't you speak to him yourself? No, I'm not set apart to do that. But you, Philip, you are set apart to do you are set apart by God and you are set apart for God to do what angels cannot do. Number six, when God finds such a person, he sends them out at Christ's ambassadors. As Christ's ambassadors. I'm seeking for a man. I'm looking for a man that will make up the edge, that will stand in the gap before me for them that I will not destroy them. And when he finds such a man, such a woman, he sends them out and sends them for seven such people. When God finds them and he says, I've been looking in the whole nation. I've been searching for a man. And I could not find in that tribe, in that tribe, in that tribe, but I have found you. That man, that woman that is found by the Lord, number seven, is single-minded, is spirit-filled, is sacrificial, and is surpassing other servants. Surpassing other servants. Satan has servants that are made to destroy people's lives. And those servants of Satan, they do everything Satan wants them to do with all their heart, with all their skill, with all their might. When God finds a servant, that servant of God will surpass the servants of Satan. Society has servants. And this society, they say, we have selected you. And we'll pay you whatever we need to pay you. This is the job you have to do for society. And those servants of society, they do everything society expects of them with all their strength, with all their power. And a servant of God that God says, I've been looking for you. Now you must be single-minded. Now you must be spirit-filled. Now you must be sacrificial. And there's something in your life. You must surpass the servants in the world, the servants of society. When God finds a servant and he says, this is he. I called him. I've chosen him. And I put him into service. He comes with everything is God and he is going to do the work surpassing the servants of cults. Cults have servants. And those cults, when they serve the cult, they do terrible, terrible things you cannot imagine. Things that will even be dangerous to their lives. But they say that's their covenant. They say that's their commitment. They will do whatever it takes so that they will fulfill the desire of the cult, a servant of God. When he comes into service, a servant of God, when he looks up to God and says, God, I thank you, you have chosen me, you have selected me, you have put me in place to do something extraordinary. That servant of God will surpass the sacrifice will surpass the service, will surpass all the skill, will surpass all the devotion of the servants of the cause. A person that is chosen of God, when God says eventually, I sought for you and I got you. When he gets you and you come, you serve the Lord and you surpass whatever you could have done if you were in the world. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the edge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. The Lord is searching. 
searching for leaders after God's own heart. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. We're reading from verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 1. Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and see now and know and seek in the broad places thereof if ye can find a man. He's searching for a man, searching for a woman. If ye can find a man, if there be any that executes judgment, that seeks the truth, and I will pardon it. Jerusalem had impending judgment, imminent judgment, hanging on that city. And God told Jeremiah, Jeremiah, run ye to and fro. Look at judgment, imminent and very near, and it's going to be very heavy. But if I can find a man, and that man loves the truth, and that man is totally available for me, and that man is going to be totally committed to me, then I will pardon that city. You see what God is saying? He says today, all he's doing is he's searching for a man. He will find you. He's searching for a woman. He will find you. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13. Acts, chapter 13, reading from verse 22. In verse 22, here is what it says. It says in verse 22, And when he had removed him, removed Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to be their ruler, to be their leader, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David. He's been searching. He's been searching. Every tribe, every locality, searching for them. And he said, eventually I found a man. I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. And when you think about that, all the explanation was given concerning such a man, you know that this man, David, fitted into those qualifications. I pray that God will find you qualified. He'll find you. He will use you. Your life will not be for the ordinary in Jesus' name. Three things we're looking at in the message. Number one, standing out of the crowd under his supreme lordship. Standing out of the crowd. If you are part of the crowd, if you are ordinary, if you are common, if you cannot stand out and say, this is where I stand, the Lord is not going to use the ordinary to convert the ordinary, the common to make other people uncommon. He has to find somebody who stands out, who is uncommon, who is extraordinary, who is devoted, who is yielded, before he can use that individual to make a change, a transformation. Number one, standing out of the crowd under his supreme lordship. Number two, sacrificing for the congregation to raise sanctified lives. God is not interested in having congregations of sinful people, they worship, but they don't know how to come out of sin. They don't know how to be righteous. They don't know how to be holy. God wants leaders that will come up and he'll place them on congregations. And these leaders will raise sanctified lives 
out of the members of that congregation sacrificing for the congregation to raise sanctified lives. Number three, seeking with Christ. Christ is still seeking. And now this person that is chosen by God, selected by God, sought out by God, sent forth by God, this person joins Christ. And hand in hand with Christ is seeking for consecrated, submissive laborers. Seeking with Christ for consecrated, submissive leaders. He will find you. You will be suitable. I said you'll be suitable. And he will use you in Jesus' name. Tell me point number one there. Standing out of the crowd. Think about that. Standing out of the crowd. If you do not have a mind of your own, if you do not have backbone by yourself, if you do not stand up and stand straight and stand out, if you cannot be taller spiritually than all the people around you, if you remain a pygmy like all the other people around, and you cannot stand higher, taller, above the people around you, they are corrupt, you are corrupt. They are sinful, you are sinful. They are unconverted, you are unconverted. They follow the devil, you follow the devil. They intimidate everybody and you are intimidated. You are fearful, you are timid. And you, you, you talk with your hands over your mouth. You don't have the courage and the might to declare, thus says the Lord, you cannot stand out. And you follow the crowd where the crowd is going. There's no hope for the nation. There's no hope for the world. God is looking for a man. He's looking for a woman that will stand out of the crowd under his supreme Lordship. Come to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. You will stand out. Praise the Lord, you will stand out. If you've been covering yourself up, you have skill, you are covered up. You have strength, you are covered up. You have knowledge, you are covered up. You have fire burning inside you, but you are covered up. What's the use of the lampstand that is under a bushel? Throw that bushel away and shine forth. You will shine forth in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 9, and I'm reading from verse 6. Acts chapter 9, reading from verse 6. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord, what will thou have me to do? That's Paul the Apostle. He was Saul at that time. From the moment of that question, and from the moment he spoke to the Lord directly, and from the moment he said, Lord, I am available, whatever, wherever, whenever, and whoever you want me to confront, I'm available, I'm here. What will thou have me to do? From the moment he asked that question, it was never the same again. Can you make tonight a definite moment in your life? Will you forget about all the people that were traveling with you like Saul? Will you forget all the past things you have done? When you forget all the intention of what you have, the goals you have, what you wanted to achieve before, and you come to stand still in your life, and you say, Lord, what will thou have me to do? From that moment on, a special anointing will come upon your life. Then the Lord told him in that verse 6, and the Lord said unto him, Arise. And go into the city, it shall be told thee what thou must do. What thou must do. 
it will be different from what you have ever done in your life. It will be higher than what you have ever done in your life. It will get you to places you have, you have never been in your life. You, have, you will be told what thou must do. We'll come to verse 15. In verse 15, it says, But the Lord said unto him, Ananias, Go thy way. For he saw is a chosen vessel unto me. He is a chosen vessel unto me. Not unto Israel, unto me. Not unto religion, unto me. Not unto his family, unto me. My special hand is upon him. I've been searching. I've been seeking someone that will take the gospel the truth, redemption, the sacrifice of Jesus that will take it to the gentle world. I've been searching. I found him. I found him. He is now a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and before the kings and before the children of Israel. You will do it. Look at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, I'm reading here from verse 15. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 15, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by his grace, it has to be by grace, he didn't know that God could ever choose a man like him. To even get saved, that would have been enough. To have forgiveness, that would have been enough. And to be a quiet, silent member of the congregation of the righteous, that would have been enough. To overlook all the atrocities he had done and make him just be a member of the church and perhaps a cleaner. And perhaps a person that is scrubbing the ground. That would have been enough. But now God chose him from the depths of the valley to the height of the mountain is by grace. That grace will play out in your life. He said in verse 16 to reveal the son in me that I of all people that I, of all the people God could have chosen, that I might preach him among the heathen immediately, I confer not of flesh and blood. Immediately, I grabbed it. I said, Lord, here I am. I am available. You will be available. But understand, the people God selects and the people God chooses and the people God sends forth, they have this quality. They stand out of the crowd. Can you think about Enoch that was from church and escaped the death penalty or the hold of humanity? He stood out. Can you think about Abraham out of idolatrous background that God chose and said, I have a covenant with you. He stood out. Can you think of Joseph that became a savior in courts for the whole land of Egypt and for all his family members to preserve lives and to preserve them alive? Joseph is stood out. Can you think of Moses? A man that God chose that he will lead the children of Israel out of captivity and take them through the wilderness until they reach the land of Canaan. He stood out. Can you think of, J of uh, Joshua and Caleb? They, they searched out the land and they came back and the ten people, ordinary people, ordinary spies, they searched or seen the land. As for the riches and richness, that land is rich. It's flowing with milk and honey. But 
were not able. But Caleb and Joshua stood out and said, were well able. Did you see giants there? Yes, we did, but we were well able. Did you see the wall cities? Yes, we did. Yet we are well able. Did you see the dangers and the difficulties? Yes, we saw, but we are well able. Did you see those Anakims there, the giants there? Yes, we saw them, but we are well able. They never said anything negative. I see the times at all. The times are difficult. How can we do anything in this situation? Even their height and even their postures terrified us and intimidated us. But no, they stood out. Think about Samuel. Samuel was raised up in the midst of the characteristics or character of Ophni and Phinehas in Eli's house. And yet, Samuel that young boy will not go on, will not partake in any of the evil. He stood out. Think about David when he came and confronted Goliath and all the other people. In fact, when Goliath came out, everybody was shivering, shaking. And even Saul said, my boy, I understand you have a good intention. You love the nation, but you cannot do this. Because this Goliath had been a warrior from his youth. And David said, Saul, king, with all due respect, don't say that. I can, and I will, and I must. He stood out. Have you thought about Nehemiah? Nehemiah, as he came to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, he had to stand out. You think about Daniel? He had to stand out. What I'm saying is, and what the scripture is saying is, if God is going to use you in a special way, and thank God he will. I said, thank God he will. You must be a man and be a woman that stands out of the crowd. Number one, stand out. You will stand out. I said you will stand out. Number two, speak out. You know, the person that is not able to speak his mind is looking at the faces of people. Do they like me? Do they hate me? Do they think I can say anything good? If I say what's on my heart, how will they respond? How will they react? Such a person will not make an extraordinary leader. Speak out. Number one, you stand out. Number two, you speak out. Number three, you stick out. You must be able to stick out your neck. Because if you don't, you will be lost in the crowd. But it is when you stick out your neck and you say, I'm here. I don't accept all that general idea. I don't accept all that weakening compromise. I don't accept all those religious utterances. You stick out your neck. That's when God will use you. And thank God tonight the hand of God is upon your life. Number four is to step out. There's no use for a person who is always at the back bench who will not step out. There's no use for a person who is always there and is in the amen corner. And then if the whole team is going, then I am going. If everybody is doing evangelism, then I will try and join them. If anybody is talking about Jesus Christ being the Savior and the only Savior, if everybody is shouting it, then I can shout with them. You must be willing to step out. You will step out. I said you will step out. If you have been taking the back bench, and if you have been putting your hands at your back, if you have been watching what everybody will do before you do anything, there's no room for a person like that to be a champion. And God is going to make a champion out of you. A conqueror out of you. But you must stand out. You must speak out. You must stick out. You must step out. You must set out. Set out. 
you search everything you are going to do and there is no question about it well the people like it that doesn't come into the question well the people encourage me that doesn't come into the question well the people appreciate me that doesn't come into the question well the people reward me that doesn't come into the question you set out i'm about to do something my life will count for the kingdom your life will count for the kingdom you stretch out stretch out you know you look at your life like an elastic band and you are not like a string of wool that cannot stretch you stretch you stretch you stretch you stretch yourself out for the work of god and for the assignment the Lord has given you, like all these people were read about, like they did, you stretch out yourself. And then number seven, you stand up with conviction. You stand up with conviction. You will overcome. I said you will overcome. No mountain will hinder you. No enemy will stop you. No condition of the nation, of any nation, will stop you in Jesus' name. People who stand out of the crowd, they don't watch the weather. They don't say, ah, oh, it's cloudy. If it were not cloudy, I would have done something. They don't know weather. They don't know economy. They don't know difficulty, they don't know mountain, they don't know anything. All they know is that God has called me, I am going to stand out for that call. You will stand out. I said you will stand out. I come to point number two now. Sacrificing for the congregation to raise sanctified lives. Let's look at the example of Jesus Christ himself because he has led us an example that we should follow his steps. We're looking at John chapter 17. John chapter 17. We're reading from verse 19. John 17, 19. And for their sakes I sanctify myself. I set apart myself. I sacrifice myself for their sakes. I'm willing to go to the cross and die. For their sakes, I became man incarnated as man, even though he had been God from all eternity. For their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified. I sanctified myself, I sacrificed myself, that they might be sanctified through the truth. It's through his sacrifice, what he has done, that we get sanctified today, and it is through your own sacrifice to declare the word, and to be there at the time of the service, even when it appears the road is blocked, and it appears the road is rough, and it appears the community is not conducive to going out. And yet, you sacrifice, and you get to the people, and through your sacrifice, many souls are going to get saved. Through your sacrifice, many souls are going to get sanctified and many are going to get to heaven. They will get to heaven. You will take multitudes to heaven in Jesus' name. And look at Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. By the which will were sanctified through the offering of of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He gave himself. In fact, the Bible says he became poor that we might become rich. He gave himself to become a sacrifice that we might be saved, that we might be sanctified. Look at verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever 
them that are sanctified by offering. If he had kept himself and he will not offer himself and he will not give himself, if he looked at the agony of the cross and the suffering of the cross and he said, I'm afraid the agony will be too much. In fact, my God, my Father, who had never separated from me, when I get to that cross and I bear the sins of humanity, he'll forsake me. I cannot bear that. If he did not bear that, we would not have been saved. We would not be, have been sanctified. We would not have been qualified for heaven. But thank God he did it. And thank God you are going to do it. I said you are going to do it. Verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. We're looking at chapter 13 of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. Reading from verse 12, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, his pure life alone will not sanctify us. His miraculous conception will not sanctify us. And his miraculous birth will not sanctify us. And his pure personality will not sanctify us. His miracle working power by itself will not sanctify us. He must die. He must sacrifice himself. And the blood must be shed. The blood of the pure lamb and the spotless lamb of God. That blood must be spilled and it's going to bring suffering. It's going to bring agony. But that is the only way a sinner can be saved. He must become a substitute. And he must become our Savior, our Sanctifier, through the way of the cross. It says in verse 12, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify, that he might make holy, that he might purify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gauge. Let us go forth, therefore. Don't abandon him. Don't leave him. And don't say, I can't go through that sacrifice. If the people of the world are going to know that there is salvation, somebody must be willing to sacrifice his own comfort, her own comfort, and go to the people and tell them that Jesus is the way. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp bearing his reproach for here have we no continuing city but we seek one to come for ourselves we're seeking the city to come and for the sinners all around in our communities we're seeking another city the city that they will get to eventually if we're going to do that and get out that city for them and show them the way to the heavenly city, we must sacrifice. We're looking at Galatians chapter 4, reading from verse 19. Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again. Paul the Apostle is saying, I'm going through the labor pains. Painful, agonizing. It gets deep into my heart, deep into my soul. But I have to do that. I have to travel, to travel in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Getting the slaves of Satan, snatching them out of the hand of Satan is not an easy job. It's not a pleasant job. It's not something you will do, and there's no difficulty at all, and there's no danger at all. Getting souls saved demands travail. Getting souls sanctified demands travail. Getting people transformed demands travail. Teaching the Word of God without deducting anything, diminishing anything, or adding anything demands travail. 
serving the Lord and helping that people will come out of darkness and come into the light is not something that, you know, we always enjoy. Everything is pleasant and all the world, they're cheering us and they're saying, well done, well done. Do more of that, do more of that. No, it comes with persecution. And it comes with the suffering. It comes with every kind of pain you can think about. Yet, those who are instrumental in getting others saved and sanctified must sacrifice. And in your congregation, that's exactly what's going to happen. Sacrificing for congregation, for the congregation to raise sanctified lives. What? are we expecting when we sacrifice it is so that number one the people might be saved and sure the people might be saved and sure they're sure of that salvation we must labor and you must spend the midnight oil and you must burn your candle almost at both ends and you must keep away and search for the word and seek for the word and prepare the message that will penetrate the hearts of the people that they will repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that they might be saved and sure. Number two, that they might be sanctified and settled. That they know for sure and they're settled that I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, I consecrated my life to the Lord, I am settled about sanctification. You will have to do that. You will have to teach them. You will have to pray with them. You will have to encourage them that they might be sanctified and settled. Number three, that they might be steadfast and sound that they might be steadfast and sound. If the members of your congregation, the members of your house fellowship, the members of uh, the church in your state, the members of the church in your region, the members of the church in your community, if they're going to be sound, and if they're going to be steadfast, that no false doctrine will change them or, sh or, or shift them. That no man, no woman, religious man, religious woman will make them sway. You must sacrifice and you must be present with that congregation and you must lead them constantly until they are sound and steadfast. Number four, you sacrifice that they will be saved, that they will be sanctified, that they will be steadfast. Number four, that they will be spirit-filled, spirit-controlled, spirit-led, spirit-guided. Our members, many of the members, they cannot take a simple decision about life. They must look for a pastor, a leader, to guide them. They cannot solve the simplest of family problems. They must look for an overseer, a pastor, a teacher, a counselor. Why don't we leave them? Why don't we so sacrifice in supplication and study and in really giving them the word of God that they will be saved and sanctified and spirit baptized, that their spirit filled, their spirit controlled, their spirit led, the spirit guided. I pray God will help us. Number five, it is so that they might become selfless in service. Selfless in service. That's how you labor. And that's why you are preaching the word unto them. By the grace of God, when I got saved, I became eager that other people that did not know about salvation will know about salvation. Nobody pushed me into it. Nobody tried to encourage me. Nobody petted me at the back. Nobody encouraged me. And nobody said, here is the material. 
the moment I got saved, I said, everyone I know must know about this. And since that time, by the grace of God, I am moving on. You will move on along. I said you will move on along. You will be selfless in service. Number six, you will be scriptural and satisfied. Scriptural and satisfied. You're not looking for title. Scriptural and satisfied. You're not looking for being encouraged and being stimulated and being lifted up and being rewarded. You're not looking for financial gain or profit. You are scriptural and satisfied that the Lord could lay his hand upon you. That he can use you as his mouthpiece. That what angels cannot do, he gives you to do. That gets you satisfied and scriptural. There will be no complaint in your life. I said no complaint in your life. What are you going to complain about? God uses you in a way he cannot use angels. And God gives you the Holy Ghost and power. And God uses you to reverse every negative thing in the lives of other people. You must be satisfied. I am satisfied. I am satisfied. Number seven, you want to lead members of the church. The people who listen to you. You have a goal. You have a dream. You have a desire that they might be strong and strengthened for every task. That they might be strong. You are not raising up a congregation of weak people, anemic people. The people that have no backbone. The people that are not sure of where they are going. Where they are going to spend eternity. You are laboring. You are sacrificing. You are doing everything it takes. That they might be strong and strengthened for every task. God will help you. God will help me. God will help me. You stand out. The sacrifice, point number three now, seeking with Christ for consecrated, submissive labor. Seeking, seeking. Isn't that what Jesus did? He came to seek and to save. He came to seek and to save. We're coming to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 10. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to seek the sinners. So, so get them saved. Not only that, after Peter had denied the Lord. And then Jesus said, Go tell my disciples. They meet me in Galilee. Even after that appearance of the Lord, Peter said, I go a fishing. And so Jesus went to that shore. Children, have you any bread? And they said, No. Throw your net there and you will catch. And they caught. And John said, That is the Lord. And then they came to him at the shore. He said, come and dine. After they died, Jesus said, Peter, Simon Peter, lovest thou me more than all these? Yea, Lord, I love you. Then feed my lambs and feed my sheep. He came to seek those that had gone astray and those who had led the work they should have done. He came to seek them. Isn't that what we are to do? We seek out people. Sinners, seek them out. Saints, seek them out. Workers, seek them out. Leaders, seek them out. Those who are discouraged, seek them out. Those who are going astray, seek them out. You will seek them. I said you will seek them. 
We're looking at Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 36. Matthew chapter 9. Reading from verse 36. In verse 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered abroad a sheep having no shepherd. Somebody must seek them out and bring them back, back to the fold. Why are we seeking? We're seeking to bring people to grace, into grace. The grace that plants salvation, that offered salvation. And many of the people do not know. They've done some bad things. They've gone astray. They condemn themselves. They feel guilty. And they will not come. They think that God will not accept them. We go to seek them out and bring them into grace number two we go to seek them out and bring them into godliness godliness they do not know the outcome of the grace of god in their lives and so i'm saved by grace but they're weak they can't receive temptation they don't know they have the power they have the authority to overcome we we'll bring them into grace and we we'll bring them into godliness. We will not leave them until we bring them to glory. You will get into glory. Your converts will get into glory. Somebody shout, Amen. Amen. Look at this. We we'll seek them to bring them into grace, into godliness, into glory. Who are these people who are seeking? Number one, worried beginners. Worried beginners. They have heard the gospel. They have given their lives to the Lord. But now, some things happening in their lives get them worried. The trial, the temptation, the persecution, and all the pressures in their lives and members of their family, all that they're doing, all the assault and all the insult, they're worried. And we cannot see them in the fellowship. You seek for them because Christ would have sought for them. You seek for worried beginners, number two. You seek for wandering backsliders. There are people who have known the Lord, but now, because of the length of the journey and because of the heat of the day and because of the harassment of persecutors, they backslide and they are wandering about. They're looking for congregations where they might hear something substandard that will not put too much pressure on them to set them on their feet or set them on their toes. You seek for the wandering backsliders. Number three, you seek for the weak believers. Weak believers. They are believers. Every little thing will intimidate them. Every little challenge will make them to stand thinking, thinking, what do I do? Can I go forward? Can I go backward? I don't want to go to hell, but this challenge is too much. Is this how life will continue? The weak believers, search them out in your congregation. Get them near. Bring them to grace and bring them to godliness and bring them to glory. Number four, we'll seek for the weeping boosters. The weeping boosters. You remember the booster? If everybody will deny you, I will not deny you. Disciple, is that not boasting? I said I've made up my mind. Whatever happens... You go into the valley, I go with you. You go mountain top, I go with you. Let those Sanhedrin people, let them come and touch you while I'm here. We'll fight it out. And Jesus said, pray that you fall not into temptation. Simon, Simon, 
I have prayed for you so that you will not fall. And when you are converted, strengthen thy brethren. Don't worry about me. I will follow you to the end. Boasting. Eventually, he was confronted. He denied. Another person confronted him. He denied. Another person confronted. He denied. And then the court crew. Then he remembered. And then he wept bitterly. There are weeping boasters like that. I thought I'll go this far. I thought I'd climb that mountain. I thought I can face anything. I thought I'll face any challenge. Those weeping boasters, get to them, get to them. Jesus got to Peter and brought him back, back to grace, back to godliness, back to glory. Number five, we watch brethren. Business has changed their conviction. Business has made them to become wayward, unfaithful, untruthful. And now they, wait, they do shady deals. And they're still claiming to be good members of the church. They can sing the song. They can repeat the quotation. They can tell the doctrine. But they are wayward. Don't gossip about them. Don't just go about saying, uh, you know, so and so, you know, so and so. Seek them out. Seek them out. The wayward brethren. Number six, the worn out battlers. Those who battle fighters. Those who fight. They're fighting the good fight of faith. And they have been doing it in their district. Anyway, they will stand for some doctrine. They want to battle it out. But now, they're worn out. I'm alone. Nobody with me. And even Jezebel is, you know, looking for me and threatening. And he says, by this time tomorrow, if I don't make you like one of those the false prophets, then I'm not the wife of the king. And then Elijah ran away. He's been facing the battle all alone by himself. And he's worn out. Seek for them. Seek for them. And they're lying down there. Even though they eat, they lie down there. They cannot come out. They cannot confront anything again. The fire has died out. Seek them out. You will bring them back again. I said you'll bring them back again. Number seven, wounded brides. Wounded brides. People have just done their marriage. And the bride, instead of being happy, joyful, excited, I am married now. It's a new stage. Something happened at the time of the marriage. Something happened at the time of the reception. And people around them are not happy. So, this is all your Christian profession. This is all your Christian height. This is all your, you know, I'm a member of deeper life. I'm a child of God. I am this and that. Those brides, they carry their heads in shame. And they are wounded internally. To start a marriage with rebuke. And to start a family with, uh, you know, negative correction like that. To start their new life in this way. Those wounded brides. And if they were workers, then they said, now marriage has taken the work of God away from you. They're not smiling. They're not happy. They might have a bold face outside, but internally, their wounded bride seek them out. Don't join the crowd. You stand out. If everybody is condemning them, you go there and lift them up. Number eight, withdrawn bridegrooms. Withdrawn bridegrooms. After that marriage, the bride is wounded, and now the bridegroom himself, uh, you know, there's no happiness, there's no joy. And if there is no joy, and he's remembering, uh, and why did we allow that to happen? Why did we allow that to happen? But those things have happened. We cannot uh, scoop up the, the egg that is falling to the ground. It's broken and spilled. What can we do? And then they cannot even enjoy each other. When they try to come near each other, all they can remember is 
we offended those people that loved us. We offended those people that cared for us. Look at what everything has ended to be now. Withdrawn bridegrooms. Let somebody go to them. Let somebody reach out to them. Seek out for them and bring them back to grace and back to godliness and back to glory. Worldly bond women. Worldly bond women. They want to serve God, but the world has them bound with things of no value, with things of no wage. Those worldly bound women, don't go there and condemn them. Smile and let them know there is grace coming from heaven. Let them know there is grace in the hand of the Lord that will take everyone in and the Lord will cleanse them and the Lord will encourage them and the world and the Lord will build them of I but number 10 willful bond men willful bond men they are bound by a habit they are bound by something negative and they say well that's who I am I'm there I'm there what can I do and you say that this is wrong I accept I'm there and you say that is wrong I accept I'm there and now willfully they continue in that bondage let somebody go there let somebody go to them and seek them out and break that bondage in their life God will use you to set people free and then number 11 wavering bridge burners wavering bridge burners look at this person he normally has the good attitude, the good character. He builds bridges of relationship between him and sisters, between him and brothers, between him and workers. Cheerful, happy, always outgoing, and he's building bridges. But now, some of the things he did, good things, some of the people he helped, good things he did, burnt his fingers. And then he's burning the bridges that he built before. And he's saying, I don't think I'm going to do that again. People, I, I don't understand. The more you do good to them, the more they do evil unto you. What if I lived a normal life and I left everybody alone and allowed them to go the way they want to go? Look at this now. Am I going to continue? I'm normally an outgoing person. I build bridges. I have good relationship. But they have, they have taught me a lesson I'll never forget. And they're now wavering as bridge builders. All uh, bridge burners, all the good things they did in the past, they now want to destroy everything. You will not destroy the good in your life. You will not destroy your good character. Every good thing you have done before, everything has gone on record and you are going to have a reward in Jesus' name. Number 12, weary bridge builders. Weary build, uh, bridge builders. They're building bridges and building bridges. They want to connect with that and connect with that. They want to reach that and reach that. They're still doing it, but they're looking out. Brother, join me. Look at this. Let's reach this community together. Sister, join us. Let's reach uh, these people together. But you see, you are the one that has a call. You are the one that has, uh, you know, the body to do that. We don't, we cannot bear the body with you. And the bearing of the body is making them weary, making them tired. Before they give up, get to them. Let more grace come into their lives. Let more godliness come into their lives. And let the glory of the Lord shine in their lives. In Jesus' name, you will not give up. I will not give up. We shall not give up. We are going to seek other people. Think about somebody. Think about somebody. If every one of us here today, if everyone listening to this message today will think of somebody, somebody is discouraged, somebody is downtrodden, somebody is beating down, somebody is uh, backsliding, somebody who is a beginner, will think of somebody and reach out to them and seek for them like Christ will seek for them. There will be a transformation in our church. A transformation in every community. Where there's no joy, joy will come again. Where there's no happiness, happiness will come again. We will do it. 
I will do it. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. It says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Your ministry will expand. Your ministry will multiply. Your ministry will touch another life. That other life will touch another life. That life will touch another life. And there will be no end to your impact. In Jesus' name. Ezekiel now. Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 13. And I sought for a man. And I sought for a woman. Among them, among us here that should make up the edge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. And I have found one there. And he has found one there. And he has found you there. Stand up now and tell the Lord, Lord, I'm available. I'm available. Lord, I'm available. You have found me. You have found me. I will do it. Everything you want me to do, I will do. I know you are searching, 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 searching for leaders after God's own heart. Here am I, Lord. Choose me. Send me. Use me. Touch other people's lives.